So um, you have already seen that slide in the previous session with Brenna, and I just bring it back to tell you that my, my presentation, I'm going to focus on the far right um, corner, in fact, uh, which is really about approaches, avenues, pathways by which we can strengthen the, the interface between the scientific, the practitioners, and the policy communities. Um, as it was mentioned previously, the CITES IPCC uh, conference was a first step in uh, building that shared knowledge and that um, interest and, sh and, and sharing also needs from the three communities, but that's only the first step. And there is, we achieve quite a lot, but not enough. And we want, if we want to go further, we really need to strengthen those collaborations and to see what kind of avenues could be implemented in different parts of the world, in different communities, in different cities. So that's what is important. And so we have three areas, as Brenna mentioned, about how we could strengthen those interfaces. And the first one is really to ensure that the knowledge generation is responding to policy and practitioner needs. And that should happen through the whole process of generated um, knowledge, through research science, and so from the design, so for shaping the priorities on which the research community uh, can investigate, but also in doing that research on the ground. So continuing, in fact, interacting with the, between the different communities to ensure that the knowledge from the different communities are shared and um, used through the whole um, uh, generation of knowledge. The second aspect is much more about um, and I know that Theta says that there are many definitions for tools and processes, but it's really to uh, try to see what kind of tools and processes we already have and or we should be developing to really support responding to the needs of cities. And the third aspect is to ensure long-term capacity and especially over political cycles. And here again, that's something that one of your questions touched upon in the previous session is really how do we ensure that what we have learned, the capacity, the training, and, and so on that has been developed can be sustainable through the time. And it's especially right in a uh, city because of the regular elections, but some of this capacity is also needed in, in the institu um, academic institutions as well. So in my presentation, I'm not going to <clears throat> go into details in all of these areas, but much more look at how um, global urban and scientific networks can support, in fact, those uh, areas. And here again, it's not an exhaustive list of things. It doesn't work everywhere. It's just to give some ideas of what can be done. So just in terms of networks, um, these are just a few examples of both urban and science networks. And in terms of urban ne networks, Julie will present much more into details. And these were uh, partners involved in the cities IPCC, but there are many more um, around. And those are more, those acting at the global level, but we know that they are also very important at the regional scale as well. So just in terms of um, scientific network futures, as uh, mentioned by Giant, is an international program with the mission of accelerating transformation towards sustainability through research and innovation. It has disappeared. And um, one thing which is directly relevant to the topic of today that we have uh, established an Urban Knowledge Action <coughs> Network, which is a, a network of scientists and innovators from all around the world which work together on these urban-related issues. And one of the aspects is not only to create a network to augment, increase the dialogues and so on, but it's also to set up research action projects that could be developed then on the ground, implemented on the ground, and make a difference in terms of solutions. 
So how those global networks can uh, support, in fact, those uh, science policy uh, practice interfaces? The first one is that they are knowledge holders. All of them are knowledge holders. Um, they provide, they can provide the vision, the different perspective, the knowledge data from their own community. And that's very important because those communities, some of it work together, but we have still a lot to learn on what is coming up in. The other aspect that they bring is also the needs of their communities. So for example, we know that cities have a lot of data, but usually they are not accessible to researchers. So that's a shame because they could be used for different purposes. But it's also the needs for scenario, risk modeling that maybe the research groups may not pick up automatically. There are also what is brought as well as some, uh, for example, scientific concepts, which may not be seen <coughs> as crucial, you know, when you de develop policy, but that uh, are seen as really key if we want to advance in an efficient way uh, options for solutions. And one example is about the system approach that uh, Brenna mentioned and that Futures has brought in fact um, back um, when we were negotiated for Habitat 3 and the new urban agenda to look at this um, um, approach which brings together in fact the earth, the built and the social systems. All of that is very complex, it's adaptative, it has boundaries, but it has a lot of, of interaction and interdependencies within the city system but also with surrounding system. And if we want to build efficient, um, efficient solution, that's really important to look at those co-benefits and trade-offs. What the, the systems approach also bring um, or put some focus on is um, the different perspective and visions, including uh, indigenous and local knowledge, for example. So to see, okay, we have some scientific evidence, but we have also some practitioners' knowledge. We have also some um, local knowledge that should be used, or at least taken into account when we develop research projects. And another example is also of this integration in that some um, options uh, could be used to respond to different policy commitments that we can have. And here is an example of how green buildings, in fact, can contribute to different uh, sustainable development goals. And that's just one example, but that's uh, the kind of interesting solution <coughs> which can respond to different kind of needs. The second way that global networks can um, or may provide support is through their role of facilitators and translators, creating space for dialogues between the communities. We don't have the, always the same uh, language, we don't always have the same interests, we don't always have the same uh, um, goals, and by just sharing them, breaking silos um, between those communities, but also within those communities, between disciplines, scientific disciplines, between sectors, is crucial if we want to go further. And building bridges when we can. What I put access to the other community, the other is quite often, you know, an animal we don't know very well and, and we may be a bit frightened about it, but when you start discussing with it, it becomes very nice and, and pleasant. We're, we're nice. <laughs> and we can even become good friends. <laughs> Um, the other aspect is, and it was a little bit touched upon before, is to address these interscale issues, which uh, comes into interplay in many different other sectors, informality, governance, uh, and management of risk, and so on. Those global networks work internationally, but their members are usually within university, within our cities, or our uh, countries, and, and all of that, in fact, allows some approaches at the different scales and responding to those um, issues. And uh, finally, another way that has been a bit explored in some places is to support living laboratories to really develop co-design and co-produce projects, both in terms of research, but also in terms of action and implementation. So that's also the kind of thing where we can do some tests in a way um, and, and support by experience. An example, so it's just quick examples on um, these facilitation roles. So the first one was this um, Habitat Exchange Pavilion, which was organized by several um, scientific organizations in Habitat 3, 
where we uh, open the space for any kind of partners from the different communities to come and address some of the urban challenges and also to have discussion with the broader public. So that has been uh, very successful in starting uh, creating some links. And then the Cities IPCC conference was a cornerstone into that um, um, dialogue space. There, I'm sure there will be other spaces in the future, and I hope we can have even a better integration, sorry, between uh, the three communities. And the third aspect I wanted to mention about the role of global networking is about building capacity. And here again, we just talked about it, that it's encompassing different things. But the fact that the sharing of knowledge between the communities is really something we really need. The sharing of data, of tools, of frameworks to be set up. So for assessments of what's going on in cities, for observations, so the monitoring of data, the kind of data we need to be able to have comparable data across cities, across the world, is really key. So this kind of building that um, is really crucial. Also facilitating peer-to-peer -peer learning, especially in terms of actions in cities. So to incubate um, climate-relevant lessons, to share experience, to build on successes, on failures as well. I think it's important as well to look at failures. That's uh, something which will be crucial to scale up, in fact, our actions. And pathways to achieve that can be through city-to-city -city partnerships, to twinning cities of similar context, uh, accounting always for um, capacities diversity, um, which is crucial, and also some partnerships between universities and cities within a local context. Quite often, um, cities, uh, city hall and universities are a few um, hundred meters apart in a city, a bit more maybe in, in Mexico City, but um, not very far, but they don't talk to each other most of the time. Well, they, don't know that someone is working on urban issues in their own cities. And an example of tools which was recently developed by C40 and applied in its different um, cities is about uh, developing um, an, uh, an accounting system or measures of city consumption and um, for um, global greenhouse gas emissions, sorry. And so these um, didn't exist, so it goes back to this consumption issue, and it's to take into account resident house and vehicle consumption, or emissions related to consumption, as well as the services and goods consumption by the residents in the city. So that's an example of tools which was developed uh, by a network and then shared, in fact, um, with other cities, which allowed them to have some uh, data in terms of uh, which here on this uh, shows the different kind of uh, aspects which were measured as well as how it is spread across the different um, regions of the world. And another example is about building scenarios and assessing risk. And this is a project which is undertaken by a series of partners which is about um, assessing priority cities in terms of biodiversity and ecosystem services conservation, as well as climate change impact and potentially other risks depending on the cities. And the idea based on these assessments is to then build scenarios within the city, between the different communities, adapted to the particular uh, city, and, and then uh, going towards implementing those scenarios and seeing how it can be developed in terms of urban design in those cities, taking into account those three main pillars, uh, biodiversity, climate, and other aspects such as water. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions later on.